So it's um, now my honor to introduce the second half of the session on translation engineering, computational biology, and precision medicine. And we're going to hear from three talented scientists in this session, Dr. Tom Stewart from the University of Chicago and the Field Museum of Natural History, Dr. Mire Kamariza, a junior fellow at the uh, Society of Fellows at Harvard, and Dr. Catherine Chianju, a postdoc postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Medicine right here at Stanford in the School of Medicine. So please join me in welcoming these three speakers, and I will hand it over to Dr. Stewart to begin his talk. Um, thank you for the introduction, and really, I'm honored to be a part of this group. So thank you to the organizers for making this space available to us to share our research with you today. My name is Tom, and I am an evolutionary and developmental biologist. So I'm interested in explaining broad patterns of biological diversity. I study the fins and limbs of vertebrates as a model system for understanding the mechanisms behind evolutionary change. And in particular, I work on the problem of how new body parts evolve. How, for example, about 540 million years ago, did the first paired fins evolve in the lineage leading to vertebrates? Or how about 365 million years ago, did paired fins evolve into limbs? That's a question of how the hand originated. Now, to ask these questions, I use integrative approaches. I think it's really critical to take that strategy. Um, and so my own work covers the fields of paleontology, biomechanics, and developmental biology, trying to target particular events in Earth's history that had an outsized effect on the way in which um, diversity is observed today. For the purposes of today's talk, uh, this is just a very brief session, so I'll focus only on one of these transformations. That's the fin to limb transition. As I mentioned, this occurred about 365 million years ago in a group of fishes called Opistis degalians. The fin to limb transition involved two major transitions in the anatomy of the paired appendages. The first was the origin of digits, and the second was the loss of the fin web. Now, most research has focused on the evolution of the endoskeleton. That's a type of skeleton shown here in light gray that first forms as cartilage and then can ossify to become bone. Our own limbs are endoskeletal in their construction, and therefore most hypotheses of the fin to limb transition have focused on the evolution of patterning systems and cellular processes in the endoskeleton. I've done work on that myself, looking at self-organization of mesenchyme and how cartilage pattern emerges, how that differs between different lineages like sharks and tetrapods. But for the purposes of today's talk, I'm gonna focus on another strategy for understanding the fin to limb transition. That is analyzing the diversity and evolution of the dermal fin rays. Now this, in contrast to the endoskeleton, is a skeletal type that evolves by, or excuse me, develops by the ossification immediately of mesenchyme. This hasn't really been considered, this structure, in the context of the fin to limb transition, because fin rays are often quite small. They don't preserve the and aren't uh, maintained in the fossil record with high fidelity. But new CT scanning technology allows for us to revisit some of these really classical specimens and discover for the first time this anatomical pattern, how it changed in this part of vertebrate history, and raises a whole set of questions about the biomechanics and development of living fishes. So to ask the question of how dermal skeletal transformation occurred in the fin to limb transition, I've been focusing on the pectoral fins, that's the homologous structure to our arms, in a group of tetrapodomorph fishes. These are animals that are more closely related to you and I than to any living species, and we know them from several dozen taxa. Again, I've been doing this as part of a larger study of multiple species, but for the purposes of today's talk, I'll just focus on one of these to give you a sense of the type of data we're working with. Tiktaalik is a really critical taxon to understand the problem of fin to limb transition. It is the most crownward positioned taxon before the origin of digits, and it's known from several dozen specimens that were collected in the early 2000s from northern Canada and the Nunavut territory. When we revisit these specimens with CT technology, we can digitally dissect out the materials revealing the endoskeleton beneath the scales and uh, rock that's preserving it. And we can also, for the first time, have details and information about the dermal fin race, as well as reconstruct the total fin anatomy to better understand the biology and function of these fins. Just to orient you, this is the right pectoral fin of an adult tiktaalik. So if you imagine your arm sticking straight out, looking from the top, 
you'll see there's one bone proximally on the left, that's your humerus. Distal to that, there's a pair of bones. These are the ulna and radius. And distal to that, there's a series of smaller bones. On top of those are the dermal fin rays. I've labeled them here in yellow and blue. And if you were looking closely at the video, you might have noticed that they differ in their distribution between the top and the bottom of the fin. So the dorsal view, the top, shows fin rays covering a significant portion of the endoskeleton, whereas on the ventral side, these fin rays are positioned distal to the endoskeleton. This has implications for how we understand the soft tissue anatomy of this animal and specifically the musculature. So we think that this pattern reveals that this animal had basically a fleshy palm with muscles on one side extending further to the tip than they were on the other side. And that pattern is observed in multiple specimens. This is the largest individual, an animal that would have been just over two meters in length when you include the tail. You'll notice here too, there's asymmetry in the coverage of the rays and the endoskeleton, as well as if you're looking closely, asymmetries in the geometry and size of the rays between the top and the bottom of the fin. Now, this is a surprising result to us. This type of pattern had never been described in fins generally, and let alone in the fossil record, and suggests that there's something interesting, some interesting adaptations about the skeleton at the tip of the fin. Now, when we consider this in the context of the whole fin skeleton, we have a better understanding of how the animal might have been using its body and how the design of the skeleton relates to the fin to limb transition. Specifically, we think that this animal was capable of maintaining an upright posture, using its fins to support the body against the substrate, and that the tip of the fin with that fleshy palm would have been in contact with the ground. Fin rays, their asymmetry, might reflect adaptation to loading from the ventral surface to prevent buckling from high loads in that direction. Again, this is just one specimen or two specimens I've shown you of one taxon, and this is a broader story. But with this approach, we've been able to ask, how did the dermal skeleton evolve? And can now say that in the lineage leading to the early digit, earliest digited forms, the fin ray was reduced in its length. Fin rays were simplified in their structure, that is, they lost segmentation and branching, and the top and the bottom of the fin became more asymmetric. Now, why should this be interesting to you? I suppose to me, this is interesting for the history of it. This is the events that occurred right before vertebrates colonized land and completely reorganized the terrestrial ecosystem. But beyond that, there's implications for biomechanics and developmental systems and their evolution. So I mentioned the uniqueness of the asymmetry as something that startled us in our um, study. And it in fact led us to go revisit specimens of a whole variety of taxa at the Field Museum. And we've discovered that this asymmetry in fin ray construction seems to be a general principle in the way that fins are built. Tuna, which are doing something completely different than Tiktaalik was, has dramatic asymmetry as well. And so exploring how, for example, these beams change in shape under different ecological contexts and how that might relate to adaptation for flexibility or resistance to breaking is a really helpful thing if you're trying to understand, for example, how to design flexible propulsors in aquatic robots. So that's ongoing work, trying to understand the mechanics of this system using the diversity of living fishes. Uh, but also looking at the patterning system of that dorsal ventral axis, trying to use fishes as a model to understand general principles about how the patterning of limbs operates. We know a little bit about this. There's wind signaling pathways that establish the axis in early embryogenesis and mutations to key genes like LIMX1B in humans can produce malformations where in this baby foot, for example, you'll notice it has no toenails and its toes are bending the wrong way. This is a dorsal view of a human foot. We're now exploring the expression patterns spatially and temporally of these genes and the signaling pathway in sharks and in zebrafish using single cell sequencing and traditional in situ hybridization approaches. So to reiterate, I'm interested in broad patterns of biological diversity. And if you wanna explain that problem, you need to understand how new body parts evolve. That question focuses us to particular events in Earth's history. And to understand that, we need to take an integrative approach using all the tools available to us to understand how and why these transformations occurred. So my work tries to span those fields um, with many collaborators. I'm grateful to have had the chance to work on these problems. So with that, I'll just say thank you to you for listening. Thank you to colleagues and mentors, co-authors and funding sources.